Um, and we are fortunate enough to be joined by Claire Lane, director of the Anti-Hunger and Nutrition Coalition, who's gonna be giving us a brief overview of what this benefit is, um, and then some suggestions and tips for getting the word out to eligible families. Claire, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really thrilled to be here today. Um, so yeah, as Jason said, I'm the director of the Anti-Hunger and Nutrition Coalition. Um, the coalition has been around since the early 90s and we work on state and federal policy advocacy related to hunger and nutrition and poverty in Washington state. Um, as you all know, part of doing policy advocacy is also working on implementation um, and administrative advocacy for those things that get passed by Congress and the legislature and pandemic EBT has certainly been one of those things that has really um, been a great opportunity and a big lift. So let's talk about how PEBT can feed Washington's kids. Um, so let's talk about what it is and where it came from. So um, Congress passed the Families First Act in at the end of March and pandemic EBT was really designed for the problem that kids and families were facing this spring when schools were closed and schools were offering meals to kids, but they had to really pivot, change their model. Um, obviously things were super challenging and difficult for schools and for families. And this was designed by Congress to help families make up for the potential lost meals that they would have had for their kids who qualified for free or reduced price meals. So PEBT is designed um, to function essentially like food stamps, but it's a totally separate program. It's really designed to make up for school meals and it is gonna follow that sort of eligibility structure. Um, so it uses an EBT card that's like a debit card to buy food and it's used, can be used anywhere that accepts food stamps. So it launched the other day and we'll talk about um, who's eligible and how it launched and how folks get connected other way. <laughs> so um, I'll say this a lot this morning, but the who is eligible for PEBT is any student who was enrolled in a K-12 school that participates in the National School Lunch Program and who was eligible for a free or reduced price school meal. So that includes any child that attended a school where all meals are free for all students um, if you all don't know about community eligibility, now is a really great time to learn about it and um, encourage your schools and your school districts to adopt it broadly this coming year. Um, community eligibility allows schools, certain high need, high poverty schools to serve free meals to all kids. Those kids are eligible for PEBT. Um, kids that attended a preschool like a Head Start or an ECAP um, at a K-12 school where those kids got national school lunch program. So there are some preschools where kids get the childcare food program, but if they're based in a K-12 school and those kids got an official school lunch and school breakfast, um, they are also eligible for PEBT. We'll talk about this more in a few slides, but any eligible child, regardless of citizenship or immigration status, not only is eligible for PEBT, but we are doing a mass outreach to those families because it's not related to public charge at all. And that's gonna be a really important message and we'll talk more about that. Um, again, any child, including kids in foster care, homeless kids or unaccompanied kids who don't have a parent or guardian, they are also absolutely eligible for PEBT. The only requirement is they had to have been able to get a free or reduced price meal um, during this last school year. So the other reason why we're making a really big push is PEBT is real money. Um, so the way Congress calculated this um, is essentially using the value of a, the USDA's reimbursement for a school breakfast and a school lunch, which is $5.70 a day per child for every day that schools were closed. And in Washington, OSPI used obviously the March 13th closure date and the average end date, which was June 19th. If you put that all together for all those school days, that's just about $400 per eligible child. So if there's a family, a low-income family with three kids, this is almost $1,200 in food benefits. 
And these food benefits, once they get their card and activate it, they have those benefits to spend for a full year. So this is really a critical resource that even if families don't feel like they need it right now, this is absolutely a resource to get them through tough times over the next year if that's needed. So $399 is, you can go back one more, is what would be eligible for kids who were eligible when schools closed. But if a family became newly eligible after schools closed, maybe they lost a job or they lost hours and they applied for food stamps, or in some cases they actually filled out an application for school meals, those benefits would get prorated. So you can see the example there gives you the example for if someone enrolled in April. If you just look at April, May, and June, the values for each of those months, again, adds up to real money. Um, so it's really important that we get the word out about this. This is this is something that can make a huge difference for families. So thank you for your comment in the chat about public charge, because I'm going to keep talking about it. Um, um, I think as Jason's heard, I also had lengthy and persistent conversations with DSHS and OSPI about how much they need to talk about this. Um, so this is for all eligible children, regardless of their status or their parent status. Um, no one will ask about a child or a parent's immigration status or citizenship or ask for a social security number when they fill out an application for PEBT. Um, it won't affect anyone's ability to apply for a green card and not for a family member here or outside the US. It is not considered a public charge. And I use all of, I say all of that out loud because um, A, I think it's really important to be super, super, super clear talking to families that this is one of the very few COVID relief benefits out there that has really no risk for families to use this benefit and one of the few that they are actually eligible for. As you guys know, um, most of the COVID relief options out there that Congress has passed have excluded immigrants in some cases um, in one case, even if a citizen lives with an immigrant, that citizen wasn't eligible for relief. So PEBT is really, really important for those immigrant families who might not feel comfortable applying for food stamps or Medicaid, but if their kid was getting free meals or subsidized meals, um, this is really important messaging to make sure that they're confident that this is a safe benefit. Um, and this is something that can actually really help them in tangible ways. So um, that thing keeps moving. Um, this, we'll talk about this more, but I just wanted to show you all one of the resources, and I'm gonna put in the chat right now a link to some of OSPI's toolkit for communication and outreach. Um, this is a really simple flow chart that just sort of gives the yes, no, the no, the exit, exit out part. Um, that uh, is because families who weren't enrolled in subsidized meals or in food stamps before the end of June still could have applied in June up until yesterday um, and still qualify at least for the $85 that of benefits that would have been available for June. That window is closed, and this is true across the country. If families weren't enrolled and eligible by the end of June, they can't get PEBT. So they had to actually have been qualified in getting a free or reduced price school meal before June ended. So we'll scroll forward and keep talking a little bit about how this is going to work. So there are two ways to get benefits. So families whose kid qualified for a uh, school meal because they were on food stamps, basic food, state food assistance. Um, those families are going to get their benefits loaded under their card starting over this last weekend and through July 7th. So whatever day families typically get their food benefits, they will suddenly get $400 or $800 or $1,200 added to their card. Um, here's the thing I learned last week. Unlike how it was discussed earlier, 
DSHS is not communicating this. Families won't be getting one of those typical DSHS letters in advance to tell them why they suddenly have a lot more money on their card. So I think it's really important that when you're talking to any families um, and the providers you work with, that they should be asking even now, hey, you know, do you get food stamps? If you do, you might have noticed, you know, when you have school age kids, you should have gotten more money. It's one time. It's a temporary benefit. It doesn't, it's not going to be monthly. It doesn't show up monthly like WIC or food stamps. It, because it's designed to make up for those meals this last spring. But families won't have any warning why they get this benefit added to their card. Um, but they'll get it. And it's automatic and that's great. About 250,000 kids will qualify to get their benefits loaded directly onto a card. But for those families with kids who get free and reduced price kit meals and don't get basic food, um, there's all kinds of reasons, but again, I'm gonna talk about public charge. Um, there are real, really good reasons why qualifying immigrants wouldn't have been getting basic food. Those families are gonna to have to fill out a very quick and simple application. That application, again, opened over the weekend. Um, and we'll talk about how people apply, but it's a, um, an unfortunate issue around the data around which kids, specific kids are eligible for school meals and what data lives at the district level and what kind of data DSHS and our EBT processor company needs to be able to actually issue a card. And we'll talk about that more, but I wanna be really clear about this here. School districts know exactly which kids are eligible for this, at least eligible when school's closed, and actually they should know. Um, yeah, they know every kid who's eligible. But we don't have that information in a way that could automatically issue those benefits. So getting the word out is gonna be really, really important because they do actually have to take a few steps to apply. Um, we'll talk about this again in the next slides about how to apply. But uh, unfortunately, after all of this planning happened, because of state budget deficits, um, DSHS staff is gonna be on furlough and part of how they decided to manage that is they are gonna be closed on Mondays, uh, beginning the day after PEBT launched um, and every Monday through July 20th. So while fa families can apply online, they can't apply over the phone on Mondays. And I just want folks to know that. So, um, and there is, I should have put the new message from uh, Washington Connection up on the slide. So the application is up and live, I've looked at it. Um, you go to washingtonconnection.org and on the application, there's a section called food assistance up in the upper right there. One little checkbox says basic food and the other one says pandemic EBT, emergency school meals program, and you click that box if you're applying online. The thing I want folks to understand, and again, this goes back partly to public charge, but also in general, um, the way this application works is completely separate from how every other application for benefits works at DSHS. Typically when apply, you apply, um, you answer a ton of questions about your household and your circumstances, and then it sort of tells you what programs you may be eligible and ask if you want to apply for them. In that process, <clears throat> families are often asked about citizenship and a social security number and a whole lot of income verification questions, things that aren't needed and aren't relevant for PEBT. And so we worked really hard to make sure that this application process is a standalone application for two reasons. One, so it won't ask any question that they don't absolutely have to ask. And two, to assure families that this information and this family data isn't shared anywhere else at DSHS. It's not connected to any other program. They're not gonna show up in any of the sort of traditional database part of DSHS because this is a standalone separate kind of program. So you can, folks can apply online or they can apply over the phone again during office hours and not on Mondays in June and July. Um, 
but the nice thing about being able to call is folks can ask more questions. Um, DSHS is doing a really good job training eligibility workers and really walking through scripts and scenarios, and they're feeling really confident that they're comfortable with this application process and able to answer questions, because again, it's really quite straightforward. So when I say simple and straightforward, there's really not a lot of questions. Um, really the key things that families have to know for each child is your child's first and last name as it appears on school enrollment records, their date of birth, and the name of their child's school or school district. Um, they do have to provide a little bit more information like a, the name of the parent or guardian, um, but it is really those key data points that DSHS is using to match against school records. Because again, we know who's eligible. DSHS is not determining eligibility. They're really just doing the mechanics of helping families get this benefit that we know they're eligible for. When I said that things like um, families will have to provide in an application the name of a parent or guardian, I've gotten this question before. So for um, emancipated minors or unaccompanied youth who don't have a parent or guardian, they can just use their own name in that field. It's not a requirement that it has to be the parent. DSHS knows that if the name on the parent or guardian matches the name of the only child applying, that is totally fine. Um, the issue really is benefits are approved if the information on the PEBT application matches the school records, and school records don't track parents' names. The other thing that's really important to know is that while they will have to provide some information about um, their city, they can choose where their card will get mailed when they apply. So if a family has moved since September when they enrolled their kids, or even since the shelter in place order happened in March, that's okay. They don't need to have the card mailed to wherever the address that the school has on record, there's a separate question about where they want it mailed. So these are the timelines and deadlines. Again, if a family gets food stamps, there is no deadline. They are getting their benefits automatically and they have a year to use them. Um, for families with kids enrolled in free and reduced price meals that don't have that, the application opened on the 28th and it must be completed by August 31st at 5 p.m. That's the end date that um, had been more flexible a little while ago and DSHS is realizing that it does have to, families do have to be enrolled before the school year starts and August 31st at 5 p.m. is super clear and understandable. Um, it is good to know that DSHS is saying it may take up to 30 days to approve applications and get the card out. They really don't think it won't, will take that long. Um, but if there's questions about the data matching, if they need to do a little bit more work, and again, with the furloughs, um, we really do think that will add a few days on it. So I think to manage families' expectations, just to let them know it could take up to a month, though it's not likely. Um, and again, this is for families who were eligible after schools closed, they would have had to apply before June 30th, and then they would get prorated benefits. So PEBT at the grocery store or farmer's market or corner stores is gonna work just like food stamps. So any store that's authorized to take food stamps will be able to take PEBT. And as the, you might have noticed the card, if you know what, um, our state's food stamp card looks like, the card will look the same as that. Um, so retailers will recognize it and know it. Um, the thing to know is that it can only be used to buy food. It's a food benefit, so it can't buy things like diapers or cleaning supplies, anything like that. It can't be used to buy alcohol or vitamins or medicine because those aren't food. And there are, if you don't know this, there are, um, restrictions on what people can use at the even at a grocery store you can't buy hot or prepared food so the example I always give is you can buy a chicken breast in the meat section but you can't buy the prepared like rotisserie chicken in the deli section 
But other than that, you can buy any food your family needs. So let's talk about um, some resources for you all to dig in a little more about the program if you need it and some resources to share with families and other providers in your network. So there is um, a public facing website. It's actually a medium page. Um, we've learned, unfortunately, you have to use the www first, otherwise you get some scary security message. Makes Medium is careful. They think it was this page was masquerading as OSPI, not realizing it actually is OSPI who set this up. So it is just www.k12.wa.us slash PEBT. Super easy to remember, super easy to use. Um, there are um, flyers. School districts sent letters to families. Um, so there's a copy of that in the link that I showed you. And those are not all on this site but the link I included in the chat box for OSPI's own actual website. They have social media posts and they have FAQs translated into these languages. And I think a few more are going to be coming soon. So this was the outreach that schools have been doing for families. They sent that letter. Um, that letter was sent only in English because districts don't have that data about what families language preferences. So again, there are translated versions of that letter. So if you work with families, you can download it OSPI site, letter in those languages and make sure they get that. Um, the flyer has also been translated into those eight languages. Um, and that it, the translated flyer is also available on OSPI site. The social media graphics, um, we have been seeing um, some of those social media posts coming from my friend's kids' elementary school on their school's PTA page. We know districts have been posting it, schools have been posting it, family, they've been, we've seen it tweeted. We saw Congressman Adam Smith tweeting one of them. Um, so we know these resources getting out there and being used and we super encourage that. Other things that schools have been doing are robocalls, you know, that sort of automated message that says, you know, there's snow and your school is closed, or hey, there's this benefit for you. Um, they've been doing text blasts and emails and follow ups. Um, but as you guys know, schools have closed. Most of that, the school outreach staff aren't working this summer. And so unfortunately, this program is launched right when schools have emptied out for real. Um, and this is why we're really trying to get the word out through the community because um, we really need to amplify the little bit that schools were able to do before they closed. So with that, I want to answer questions um, and see what you've got for me. I'm going to check the box. Thanks so much, Claire. And yes, I do want to put a little bit of time aside for questions. There's a couple in the chat. Um, one that I had, uh, an earlier slide mentioned that this can be used to purchase some limited home food delivery options. Could you just quickly touch on that? So for folks that may not know this, um, Washington was one of the first states to be part of a pilot to allow online food purchases with SNAP. <coughs> Typically, there's always been this really um, stringent restriction about having to enter your PIN at checkout, which you can't do online. Both Walmart and Amazon have been part of this online pilot. Um, and it has expanded um, much more broadly. So if a family lives in Amazon or Walmart service delivery area, they can also use their food stamp benefits or PEBT through Walmart or Amazon online. Wonderful, thank you. Um, a couple questions in the chat here. Um, someone asks, has there been any outreach regarding public charge? I've noticed a couple instances where people are not willing to apply because they see that this is a federal government benefit that typically has this applied to it. Yeah, I think that's where um, the language and the FAQs that is so specific about public charge not affecting a family member in the US or outside the US 
I worked really closely with the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project and One America and the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network to really um, hone in on simple, easy to translate messages about public charge. And I think, um, you know, I've done outreach work for a long time for programs. And I think you can't convince someone who's super scared. What you can do is give a lot of information um, and be as encouraging and as positive and concrete. And to say things like, we know that Medicaid has a public charge. We know that food stamps have a public charge. School meals have never, ever even been considered. They are not a public charge. There is no evidence that this will ever be affected. PEBT is a short-term program. Like Even if uh, Homeland Security wanted to make it a public charge, it'd be a super short program to try and track people down for and monitor. So I think really the best we can do is be really explicit. I mean, I have said to organizations, we have documentation from the Department of Homeland Security to USDA saying explicitly it is not a public charge and it will not count as a public charge. Great, thank you for that. A um, couple more questions in the chat. For families enrolled in SNAP whose children may not be already enrolled in free and reduced lunch, will they be able to receive this benefit? So if a family is enrolled in food stamps, they are automatically enrolled in free meals. So folks should know that. Um, if they're enrolled in food stamps and the families didn't use free meals, they should still be getting the benefit right on their card. If the family's not in, if the kids are not enrolled in a K-12 school that serves national school lunch, they won't get it. So you do have to actually be enrolled in a school, a K-12 school that offers national school lunch and school breakfast to those kids. If that doesn't answer the question, let me know. Um, and then there's a question just to reiterate, what is the deadline to apply for this benefit? So families who have to fill out an application have until August 31st at 5 p.m. to fill out the application. Um, and then they have a full year after they get their card to use that food benefit. Um, two things quickly to know about that. Um, families will have to activate their card. Their card's um, initial uh, PIN code will be their zip code of where the card has been mailed to. And then they get to set their own PIN that they use when they go grocery shopping. Um, so once that card is activated with that PIN is when that clock starts on that one year of using those benefits. And then I think we have time for one last question. And the, the question is regarding outreach. Uh, are we getting the word out to community leaders, especially those of diverse backgrounds, people who are trusted messengers in their communities? We are doing our best to do that. So like I said, we've worked really closely with um, a whole bunch of immigrant rights and immigrant serving organizations and really taking their lead on sort of messaging and what makes the most sense to their communities. We're doing a ton of um, outreach in King County in particular because we know communities are so diverse and sort of who gets the message and who they're hearing from is really important. Um, and then I would say I mean, we are doing everything. I spent yesterday planning an outreach event or an information event with Congresswoman Schreier's office where, um, where we're trying to get a real focus on um, Spanish speaking families and trusted messengers, uh, particularly for ag workers in the central Washington part of her district. So we are really trying to be super targeted to immigrant organizations and communities and um, homeless kids and families and providers, because we know those are the two populations of kids that when schools closed, they are by far the most likely to have lost contact with their schools and to really not be getting information, not just not getting information from their schools, but really in need of assistance in these tough times. 
Thank you, Claire. Um, and for everyone who is calling in by phone, um, Claire has put her email on the screen there. It's claire.lane2 at gmail.com. I definitely encourage you to follow up if you have any questions or if you want to further connect on this issue. Claire, thank you so much for joining us here this morning. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for everything you've been doing to get the word out about this and organize this. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely.